Jeannie's here to help um, facilitate our meeting tonight and guide our questions. And we're going to be getting data presentations from Stephen that we're going to get feedback on. I just note that I'm here because Diane can't be here. Oh, she cannot so. be here. Okay. Just a note on the agenda. Stephen's going to start with this baseline reconfiguration um, budget data, I think. And then we also have a configuration matrix that the committee asked for um, the last time we met as a finance committee. I think each time we'll do this twice. He'll, he'll present, then we'll have an opportunity to ask some questions and provide some feedback. And then the same for the other piece so that we're giving um, two different sets of feedback. Is that right? Yes. That makes sense? Great. You ready? I'm ready. Take uh, it away. All right. So I'm posting in the um, chat the uh, the slideshow that I'm going to do. I'm going to already just apologize. Just as we were walking out, we realized there were some some errors in it. That's going to get cleaned up. But uh, um, the board members here and everybody here should have a copy of it. Um, and then I will share my screen here. Um, on. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Let me share. All right. All right. So what you see on your screen, and um, let me go back to slide number one, and. Um, what you see there in front of you is our first draft of the baseline budget. We've also included the reconfiguration uh, for the three elementary school, sixth grade at U32. We know there's a whole lot more questions and things like that. We, can, we, we certainly will be able to cover those. But one caveat and a very important thing to remember is that as we put this together, we have not spoken to any personnel about potential reductions or anything like that. So you're going to see mention of positions that are reduced. We do not know, you know, we've not spoken to anybody about that. This is just for the purposes of providing you with this information. But the final outcome of our, um, our, our staff and all of that and how it's configured that none of that is actually included in this. And so I just want to be careful because when we talk about positions, those are real people. And so, um, so there are a lot of different ways for us to go about that process. This is just the budget process. So, um, so I, just want to, I, I just want people to know that I'm not talking about your job um, when I'm talking about any position. Um, and that should we ap actually get to a point where we're eliminating or changing jobs, we'll be communicating fully with people about that. And I think that's the biggest caveat because I, I do understand it will be nerve wracking for some people. And I think we just want to hold in that there are emotions already involved with that. So just be careful for us. Um, we have the budget development timeline. This is the beginning of it. Today's the 16th, which actually is before the 18th. Um, so that's the budget training, the budget assumptions, approval, uh, capital improvement project uh, budget. All of that stuff is going to be there um, in the September 18th. So, so our Wednesday meeting is going to be even more comprehensive than what we see here. We focused a little bit more on some of the configuration pieces that will be a part of that, but there's other information that we'll be including uh, when we get to Wednesday. Um, and then we will go through um, October 1st is our um, is when we need to make a decision about whether or not we're putting something to the voters about uh, configuration. Then October 16th, we will be starting drafts of the budget. So this is the baseline budget you see here but by um, draft number one presentation. And then we'll be moving through the budget drafts. March 3rd and 4th is what we're um, shooting for. That's when the informational meeting and the town meeting day votes will occur. And so there's a lot more details in here about uh, staff participation, um, the leadership team's input, all of that. But these are just the big dates, and we want to make sure that those were there so you can see where the community engagement and community presentations were as well, just those, those big pieces. 
Um, so this agenda, reviewing the process and guidelines, review the baseline and reconfiguration, review estimated tax implications, and when we say rough tax implications, please know that this is based upon some of this year's information, so um, there, it, there is nothing out there yet about next year, so that you're aware of that. And then there's some be discussion, those are the questions that are a part of all of this. And so, just a reminder, our goals of the strategic plan that we're building things around, so um, we have those three goals. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, just reminding us. And just remember that our values and beliefs are what drive us as we build, um, as we build this budget. So these are a part of all of that as well, and just a reminder of those things. So the assumptions, uh, there's quite a few assumptions in this, and you can see we have our contractual increases. There is an estimated increase of 15% for health insurance. Um, there are inflationary increases for non-payroll expenses. Um, the capital fund transfer, debt service update, um, reductions in tuition revenues, uh, a reminder that we used $485,000 of our fund balance last year to reduce taxes, and then very, very, very rough estimates for tax rates using current year information. You, you notice I'm going to keep saying that we really just be, be careful. Our enrollment numbers, just as a reminder, so if we need to go back to those, oops, sorry, jump quickly, so that if we have any questions around the enrollment, those are there for us. So, what we're actually waiting for and have uh, been wondering about, our baseline budget. So, if we took everything that we were doing this year and we moved it forward one year, so the exact same configuration, exact same staffing, we would have a baseline budget increase of 12.48% for our net education spending increase. Um, that is every 1% increase of the budget is 341000 a 3% increase in the budget, and this is, I'm using that as uh, if we set our increase at 3% over this year's spending, that would be a million dollar, um, 1.025 million increase, and that would require us to cut from, to get from the 12.48% down to 3% would require us to cut $3.2 million out of our budget. I know that I use a really low percentage number, but that's also based on inflation, the governor's letter, all of those kinds of things. We just wanted to make sure that we kind of use like what's the, where, where's kind of the bottom of this. Any questions on that? Okay. And then um, we also, the 12.48% puts us up against the excess spending threshold. Um, we're, we're over it with that increase. So the threshold is um, $16,108.20 per student. That's the student cost. Um, and so um, the number of students in our long-term weighted average daily membership is 2,355 students. And the, so the excess spending threshold is at 37,936,000, which we would need to reduce to five, by 509,000 just to get us to the threshold. So half a million dollars to get us from the baseline down to where we were not over the excess spending threshold. Stephen, I would just add that that excess spending threshold is also an estimate because it's yes. based on long-term weighted average daily membership which I don't have the official from the state, but I've made an estimate, uh, and I've estimated a decrease down to 2,355.11. So even that excess spending number is an estimate. Right. Okay. The next piece, um, this is our current configuration, just to remind you of that piece, because these will, this will be important for us to think about as we look at the uh, configuration one. Um, then this is our current staffing as well, and this is what we carried forward as part of our baseline um, estimate for budget. Chris, this is Andrews. Oh, Chris, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chris. You're muted, Chris. Suzanne, is your estimate a conservative estimate or a permissive one? Uh, 
I would say it's an estimate based on our projected enrollment for FY26 and what is missing is how the state will determine our actual students at each location and their sparsity rates and their free and reduced lunch ratios, the, the things that all go into the long-term weighted average daily membership piece. And the enrollment is also projected. Okay, uh, so, so do you have a sense as to where those different factors may come in so that we, whether this is understanding it's an estimate, is it something that's somewhat solid or is it really can be very movable? I, I don't think it will move a ton, but again, it's, it's a, it could be luck of the draw kind of thing. Like this is where we were at last year and that's what I use for a measuring stick is here's where our, our free and reduced lunch rates were last year, here's where our sparsity was by town last year, and then I applied it to the projected enrollment. So. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. And and then we have a pie chart that shows how expenses are broken out under that budget. And so you can see that um, when you look at this direct instruction, co-curricular activity, special education, those are the big bulk uh, and transportation are directly related to students. All right. Just giving everybody a moment to look at that. All right. So um, this is where there's a typo on yours. We printed it before we caught it. Um, but the reconfiguration budget, so this is when we look at three elementary schools in the sixth grade through six through 12 at U32. Please make that correction. <laughs> it is a 5.49 net education spending increase. Now the, so um, the every 1% increase in the budget so 341,000, a 3% 3 increase is so 1.25, 1.025, and then um, a 3% increase in the budget would require us to cut from, um, from the reconfiguration baseline budget down to, uh, would require us to cut 849,000. And then we are below the excess spending threshold. We do not have to. Um, we do not have to consider that in this case, and it's using the same long-term weighted average daily membership for for us. Suzanne, the the excess spending threshold comes with a penalty this year. Yes. And how's that penalty calculated? Uh, for every dollar over, you're taxed twice on that that dollar of spending. Thanks. Okay. All right, that would be a configuration that looked like this at the three elementary schools. Um, we didn't include the configuration for U32. You've seen this slide before, but just a reminder. So that was that was the change right there with the schools denoted. Now, this, I didn't want to, um, we were not able to get through all these numbers in a way that really helped us um, make sure that we were accurate. So what I did was I highlighted all the spaces in which we know there would be changes to um, staffing, but this is still the same staffing numbers under our current system. And so, these are all the areas in which the staffing would change. I just couldn't be accurate enough before this moment to be able to make those um, th those those changes. Just wanted you to know this. All of these things would be affected by the reconfiguration, um, as far as we can tell. There's a few that are not, um, and there could be decisions made in the budget process that change some of those other numbers. So if it makes sense, this is just the highlighted ones would be affected by reconfiguration. 
all of these numbers could be affected by any other drafts of the budget. So it just kind of gives you an idea of what would be touched. Although not a whole lot of real data there, just to be honest. And then this would be the breakdown, the pie chart of the three pre-K to fifth grade schools and the 612U32. So you could compare these two charts. So here are the actual numbers for the baseline budget. So you can see, and I think I can turn this over to you at this point in time to explain some of it. Yeah. Uh, so just a reminder that the budget expenditures are the amount that the district plans to spend, which is the dollar amount that is warned and voted on. Revenues represent the money the district anticipates receiving to offset those expenditures uh, in this draft. Sorry, mine's very, very tiny. Uh, we've got a, an expenditure increase of 9.05% for the, the current configuration, a decrease of 6.6% in revenues, which gives us a net increase in education spending of 12.48%. Uh, if we look to the configuration model with the three pre-K to fifth grade and the six through 12 at U32, we have an increase in expenditures of 5.49%. The same decreases in revenues. I will say that the revenues uh, will continue to adjust for special education spending. So as the special education spending gets refined, the special education revenues will also change in alignment with the expenditures. Uh, so for now, net ed spending on the three school model, uh, three elementary school model, we have a increase of 5.49%. Sorry, Suzanne, can you, I'm out of my budget training. I'm seeing a nine and a six on this side and five and six on this side, but how are we getting to the 12 and the five? So very bottom line. Yeah. 12.48% yeah. is your net ed, ed spending. Yeah. Where so that? your expenditures minus your revenues, mm -hmm. last year were at 34 million, and this year for FY26 would be at 38 million. So that difference of 4.2 million is a 12.48% increase on the, the current configuration. And so oh, okay. if, if you I'm look at the same at the numbers on the bottom. Instead of the yep. raw numbers, got it. Okay, yep. got it, thank you. All right, Ready? okay. We had been asked to provide um, the baseline, um, or the budget by building per pupil. And so you can see in the baseline budget, the top one, um, and then the reconfiguration budget, you can see the per pupil expenditure. What we did in this budget, in this scenario, is we um, proportionally divided out um, the, some of the central office expenses. So transportation, um, you'll have to transportation, yeah. special education services, and then central office services themselves. Yeah. The capital transfer, the food service transfer, all of that is located in the central office budget, and so that's allocated proportionally by pupil in each of the individual school budgets because we don't track those by the school, we track them at the central office or the school district level. That makes sense what we did? Mm -hmm. Okay, just wanna make sure we're explaining it correctly. And then 
really, really, really <laughs> rough tax rate estimates. So Suzanne, I'm going to let you explain these. <laughs> sure. Um, here I just wanted to provide you with some general information regarding Vermont's statewide education funding system. And part of what happens is uh, this division between the homestead rate, the non-homestead rate, and then how much the general ed fund contributes. And so in, in this, uh, in FY25, the current year that we're in, 63% of the district's budget was funded through a combination of non-homestead property taxes and the general ed fund. So things that are not your homestead tax rate. Uh, in FY24, that number was 67%. And one of the things I talked to Stephen about was, boy, that's really indi indicative of what we saw in our tax rates. We saw those tax rates go up because your CLAs went up, your property values went up. So you were actually sending, you were receiving less from the general ed fund because of it. Mm -hmm. and, and it was actually 4% less. Interesting. Is that the biggest decrease? I've only been tracking this for a couple of years, so I, I don't have a long trend on that. And last year was the same as the year before. It stayed the same at 67, so. Uh, here is where we've taken the estimated long-term weighted average daily membership of 2,355 and divided each of those two budgets out to get our um, per pupil cost which is compared to that excess spending threshold amount. So in the, the current configuration, that amount is 16,325 per pupil. And then in the reconfiguration, it's 15,309. So both are an increase. The first is a 13.53% increase, and the second is a 6.46% increase when we do it out per pupil and compare it to FY25's per pupil, which is 14,380. Right. So these are the rough tax rate projections that Stephen's been talking about. And I'll just go down through some of the, the reasons why it's rough. Uh, we've got a long-term weighted average daily membership. That's an estimate. We don't currently know these CLAs. Uh, the CLA divider is going to be done differently for the tax rate this year and I just got a calculator for it on Friday and so it's not incorporated here. Essentially it comes out to the same bottom line tax rate, it's just the way that the legislature wants us to tell people how it's done. Um, so I don't know the CLAs yet, these are just the current years. The property yield, I don't know yet, I won't know that until December 1st, again it's just the current years. I may start to get some ideas depending on what comes out of the AOE for estimates, so I may be able to mold that as we get further into this budget process. Uh, again, the spending long-term weighted average daily membership is at 16,325 for this baseline budget, and that's an estimate because it's based on an estimated long-term weighted average daily membership. And so then that means the equalized homestead tax rate is an estimate. So you've got an increase in each of these tax rates. Uh, they range from, I don't have that number written down, but 2485 to 2795 look like the ranges between Worcester and East Montpelier. Overall, 13.52% in the tax rate for the baseline budget. So it took me a minute on this one as to why were all of them the same percent increase? When in, it's because the CLAs don't move the same way together. So once the CLAs are calculated, that's what create and um, and that's one of the things that creates a different increase percentage wise for each of the towns. Because it took me a minute to like wait. It's a percent change from your last year's CLA. Right, and yeah. so there, there's 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 several things that happen at once. Um, that are would differ from what we have right here. This is just, you know, we're basing it on the same CLA. So, all right. So that's um, the baseline budget. This is what it would look like for the reconfiguration. Oh, but Suzanne. Yeah. So we're we're seeing the same factors. So estimates again across the board for the CLA and the long-term weighted average daily membership. But we take that budget and we come up with different tax rates. So it looks like it ranges between 11.87 cents and 13.35 cents uh, in Worcester and East Montpelier respectively. So 6.46% increases 
in the tax rate with the reconfiguration model. So, this is not all the information we're getting tonight, but that gave us the first quick baseline budget. So, just what are some of your observations about this data? And I open it up to any members of the committee. Stephen, are you looking for feedback? Are you looking for feedback? So, so I think that what else, if there are some things that you think, okay, we need some more, there's pieces, remember? Just as a reminder that we do this presentation so that we can can make this presentation as best as we can for the board on Wednesday. That was what we had asked of this meeting um, so that we can give you um, as much information as possible as clearly and accurately as possible for you to be able to make decisions as a board. So. Chris. Thank you. Um, uh, two things. One is um, I'd like to see the, we were talking about a, a four elementary school configuration and see what that budget looks like as well. Um, you know, suspect it will come between these two that we have presented here, but to, I, I think really grapple with what may really happen, having a four elementary school configuration budget would be helpful. Um, and can you identify, I calculated the difference between uh, the current a potential increase uh, in a three elementary school increase, uh, a difference of two million three hundred three hundred ninety one thousand four hundred and fifty nine dollars. That's the difference between those two budget increases. And what would how how are we saving? Where is the savings of two million three hundred ninety one thousand four hundred ninety five fifty nine dollars coming out of? Unless I, I'm misreading that, I could be. No, you're 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 not misreading it. That that uh, so remember that personnel drives the biggest um, part of our budget, and so much of that is personnel savings. And then there are also some savings around uh, the just building upkeep and all that. Although you'll see that we added some money in there um, just for the overall keeping the buildings open and um, just to have them. Well, um, anything else, Suzanne, that we have? Capital, capital <laughs> yep. you know, building operations. Right, Suzanne, I'm sorry, sorry. You'll have to talk in the microphone. Capital, building operations, those are the, the biggies, but personnel is the largest uh, driver. Do we know how many FTEs we're talking about? No, that's the number that I didn't have an accurate one quite yet um, uh, for the chart. Um, we yeah. used yeah the background um, spreadsheet, yes, but not on the chart. So I need to update that for the board for Wednesday, and I'll have that. Uh, okay. Um, it seems like that would be a significant number of personnel to get that greater savings. Yes. And does that impact programming? So our first goal in reconfiguration was not to change any programming. So is there an impact on programming then? Let me phrase it quite a little bit differently. Not that we can tell right now, but the leadership team is going to look over this again just to make sure. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I just ask about... Um, Looking at the baseline budget with no reconfiguration changes, is it? I mean, I'm I'm interested in understanding a little bit more about the drivers for the cost increases. I I'm, I see the budget development assumptions. Health insurance certainly jumps out as one, but I was interested if there was more on the cost side. Um, if you could give any more sort of hierarchy, I guess, of, of what the cost cost increase drivers are? Yeah, uh, I would say that the salaries are based on uh, negotiated agreements where uh, folks receive an adjustment to the salary schedule plus a step increase where it's warranted. So if they're at the top of the schedule, they don't receive that step increase, but several of them do. So that's the salary. So um, health insurance, 15% was selected. Uh, 
following pretty closely some information coming out of the state talking about increases in rates at the hospitals. We could actually be looking at higher. Uh, one number thrown out recently was 17%. I'll know more as we get closer to January 1, um, but I opted to go with 15% for this estimate because it's so early. Uh, and then utilizing uh, an inflationary factor on current uh, last year's actuals for supplies and other line items. Um, so a 3.6% uh, increase based on the July uh, Northeast CPIU uh, inflation plus an estimated 5% for next year uh, to give us the two year distance between those two years. Uh, those are the biggies. We also had a few positions that are currently grant funded that um, are yeah. not grant funded, um, or it does not look like they'll be grant funded moving forward, so those had to move into the operating budget as well. Yep. So again, it's a baseline projection. It's what we currently do uh, and provide for programs and services. So that's why those uh, grant positions were moved into the general fund budget. Um, capital is the other one, capital, capital increase. Yeah, which direction did the debt service go? So the down, data. it okay. goes down. Yep. The interest, interest payment goes down as we pay down the principal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last year, health insurance went up 18%. Six, I think it was 16. 16. Yeah, year yeah. over year increase in health care. Yeah, and I don't know if you follow the news much, but they, you know, this has been a really hot topic. Yeah. And and they are talking again, like it's going to go up double digits. Mm -hmm. Pretty confidently, based on the fact that they've approved rates at the hospitals. Um, it's going to require that because our people tend to go to the hospitals that are local. Yeah. Chris, you had another question? I do. Uh, what is our debt service number? Um, and how many schools do we have that are currently servicing debt? Or how many buildings are we servicing debt for? When you say what is our debt service number, what you're looking how, for how much, what's the budget number? What do we have to put aside in our budget to service our debt? Real dollars. So debt service in this budget is nine hundred seventy six thousand two hundred and seventeen dollars for the FY twenty six budget. And that would be the same for both. Uh, currently, Doty, U32, and Callis do not have any debt service. The rest do. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Implications? Um, yes, I have another question. I'm sorry. Um, the positions that are being moved from grant funded into the operational budget, um, when we took those on, was there any sense that we would not be moving them into the operating budget, or was, our, uh, was it discussed that we would be moving these into uh, the operational budget if those positions were no longer grant funded? I think that the hope on those positions is that they would be absorbed by the general fund budget. All of those are positions that the the various schools value for their programming. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't be discussed as we move forward into new versions of this budget, the drafts. Okay. Here. You know, if we just, I don't recall, just, well, and, and again, not holding you to anything, but do you know if we had that very direct discussion about moving these grant-based uh, positions into the operational budget if the grant funding ran out? Um, what I prepared here was a baseline budget mm -hmm. for current programs and services and what they would cost next year. Right. 
And so if the revenues go away for funding those programs and services, then this budget absorbs them. Does not mean that in a future draft, we would not cut them, honestly. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that we would either. We haven't had those draft discussions with the leadership team. Right. And Chris, I think I, I think your question also is that when we first hired these positions, did we um, talk about them as uh, if the grant went away? I don't think that we had any lengthy discussions on a couple of these, but I do know that some of them, like the, um, the SAP teacher um, that's here at U32, we had talked about that some um, as to whether or not we would roll that into the, the, the operating budgets. But I would also just add that some of these uh, grants are going down in the amount of funding that we had at the same time that our, um, that our salaries are going up. And so I don't think that we necessarily considered were we going to take these on directly. Um, I don't remember some of those conversations occurring. Okay, um, and, and it's just kind of a reflection back on when we were hiring for with COVID money, uh, same thing about whether or not we were going to continue on those positions. And, and I think we ended, largely did continue them on. Um, but it's just, so it's just trying to orient myself. Uh, yep, thank, you, thank you. Yep, for the that's response. correct. Thank you for the responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I know the, the limit of this, uh, budget on paper is for next year, but have you looked um, in, in in following years, given the two different scenarios and, and how um, how the configuration budget would um, would proceed in the future years? So, so I would say that we haven't gotten past this year, right? And at, at this moment, we're we're trying to see. In, in other words, I think the question that we would be trying to answer is is the number of personnel that we have in the reconfiguration, the number of personnel that we would need to continue to carry forward as we reduced an enrollment, what I think would be the big question that we would have to ask, you know, so it's, it's kind of a balance of, okay, what, what do our enrollment projections tell us about the number of personnel that we need? Cause that's the biggest driver of the budget. Yeah. There's also an element there. I think the you know, the out years and, you know, in anticipation of potential, Re reconfiguration. There's very little, you know, capital money for Callus and Doty in in the budget for next year, and then the year after, and then the next two years after that, there are some much much bigger capital numbers. And so, looking out as well, the capital impact is going to be much greater in the future than it is for just next year. I will say that capital is the only one I've looked further out than FY twenty six. I went five years out on that, so I took your five year plan that you've got and just removed Callus and Doty. So. So, Suzanne, the five-year plan that we've been looking at does not include Callis and Doty in the future. That was a, just kind of a precaution. No. Um, the one that you currently have has it in FY27 and FY28 and 9 and 30. Okay. We did not budget anything in 26, not knowing what the board and the communities would decide. So the current capital budget that's going to the board on Wednesday does not include anything in 26. That's it. It's okay. it's in the future after that. I Thanks. have looked out five years into the future and seen what the capital will look like if we were to remove Doty and Calvis. Okay. Um, I, so it's only a, if they're removed, not a, if they're continued on future That's expenditure. That's the, the current plan that goes to the board on Wednesday has them if they're carried on. Oh, they do. Okay. If they are still open. That is what you will be looking at on this Wednesday. Okay. We just did not budget any projects for them in FY26. Okay. Thank you. I'm wondering if we could include what the um, threshold penalty, like what is the threshold um, and then what the penalty is if you have it. Um, Maybe for Wednesday. I don't want to put a lot on you guys. Why not? Um, we can look and see if we can include it. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll do our best. And I noticed, like, we had that. Um, whether we hit the the threshold or not on the baseline current configuration, we did. Can we have a similar sheet for how far away? The from three. It? But we don't hit the threshold with the reconfiguration. Okay. 
How far yeah. away? Yes, there, there is one. There's one, right there. there's one yeah. prepared. It's just not here. Gotcha. Uh, Did I miss it? it he printed it before I changed it in the slides. Oops. Our oh, timing was a little bit off. Okay. My fault, not him. <laughs> it's okay. Suzanne gets huge kudos for the amount of work and time she put into doing this. Yes. Like, let's. I was. Autism, I asked it's okay. It. But I have another one, but I'm trying to figure out where it was. In the description of the configurations, towards the end. You're talking about the classroom configuration? Where we talked about... 22? There we go. The budget by building for people. Mm -hmm. And we let the reconfiguration budget, um, possibly instead of school, we say site. Yeah. Yep, exactly. That's That was our error. So that we'll just have those as the sites. As we had talked about. And, and on the budget bill, it, bill, it, look, it looks like there's no change in U32. So is that is that not as I assume that's not assuming a move of sixth grade. It is assuming sixth grade moves to U32. There is no need to increase staffing at U32 if the sixth grade goes to U32. Okay. I think he's looking at projected enrollment stays the same. Or, or or is it actually an exact swap? It's not exact, but. Yeah, I see what you, I, I see the number. We just need to double check that number. Okay. You, you, that, that actually would be helpful to know what the, I'm sorry for interrupting, the, the numbers, projected numbers, whether they include the sixth grade or don't, and the reduction, is that because mm -hmm. the sixth grade is moving out or some other reason? Because that gives a, Kind of a projection for what the community, is, how many more students are coming up through the community pipeline? Uh, I think if you because if we're moving two really two classes, that makes a difference in terms of what the projections are for student yeah. school populations. Yeah, this is a really good point. I think we we need to go back and double check those numbers about the enrollment to make sure that and to make it clear in each one where we have the sixth grade included and we don't have the sixth grade included. Okay. So we'll we'll make sure that that shows better. Okay. Um, I was going to try to answer some of those that question. What do we observe about the data? I guess one thing I observed was the pie chart that breaks out our spending is useful once, and the difference between the two pie charts is not terribly useful because. I think it's lost in the vastness of the gotcha budget size. Um, I guess in a perfect world, I would be interested to see, like, in terms of the increases in expenditures, like how those break down by category. Mm -hmm. uh, like in, uh, for instance, healthcare, a fifteen percent increase in healthcare. But what does that represent in terms of? Uh, its share of the total expense increase. And um, contractual increases and capital fund, you know, so on and so forth. What What's the sort of breakdown of where these increases are coming so from? So that's on your budget summary sheet, your comparative summary sheet. Um, so it's not in the slideshow, it's part of the budget packet. Okay. Oh, but we can include that. Closer look. Yeah. yeah. But but it's a good point to make. We can include that in the slideshow as well. Mm -hmm. Daniel, were you thinking of something visual or do you want it in the like budget breakdown like we typically get? I'm curious. Um if it's visually represented in a Yeah, I understand the question. I'm not sure what my answer. Okay. I'll take a look and see which one makes more sense. I think mm -hmm. Also, I'm suffering from only having about it. Uh, half an hour to preview all of this. Absolutely, but um, we understand. The other thing that I really want to understand more about is the general fund. The thing you mentioned about the general fund and a smaller share of our budget coming from the general fund, and I'm the Ed I'm, Fund at the, the state Ed fund. Yeah, sorry, and I'm interested also in the uses of the Ed Fund, which isn't isn't something that we have but I, i'm sure it's publicly available the like breakdown of how the ed fund is used in ways other than 
um, <laughs> contributing towards our budget. Um, because that's alarming to me that it's that significant of a drop in in one year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's probably not something I would have for Wednesday's meeting, just uh, yeah. to let you know, but no, it know. could be incorporated for later. Freelance research on that one, I think. You know, could you? Um, yeah, I had a question on slide 22 on the budget for people. Mm -hmm. For the baseline, and I feel like I should know this from last year, but why why is the budget for people so different between schools now? Like the 26 for Berlin versus 35 for East Mobilia. So some of it's dependent on student need uh -huh. um, at those buildings. And so that's probably your biggest uh, difference between um, each school. So if there were a school that had um, a higher, um, higher need for paraprofessionals or something like that, that could quickly change those numbers. Okay. I'm just, I'm curious because Berlin has the most IEPs based on the data that we saw mm -hmm. before, but it has a much lower budget per pupil than a higher school. More pupils. It has just more some pupils. Of yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So pupils. it's just the. Yeah. Okay. And we're also seeing that economy of scale, interestingly, at Doty, which is also at. I wouldn't say you're seeing economies of scale. Well, yeah. You're you're seeing where a small school has done a a really admirable job of cutting back yeah. to as low as they probably can cut. Well, there's probably more, but it's you know it's, they've cut quite a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Chris. You had another question or comment? You're you're muted, Chris. Thank you, Stephen. Sorry about that. Um, Susan, Suzanne, when you say a school is cutting back, uh, so that like a small school is cutting back on what they need, school's not, is the school doing that individually, or is that basically a leadership team uh, decision that is, is incorporated? Because it's not about cutting back on what they need, it's about cutting the budget to match their needs. And because they're a smaller school and have fewer students, they have fewer needs. So okay. their budget is lower. It's cut to, to meet student needs. Okay, so the school itself is not making that independent decision. No, no we do that work as a team. Okay. Um, with the um, different amounts on, on, on page 22 that are allocated for each school's um, um, budgeting, is the um, bonding for each of the schools that have bonds, is that amount of servicing that debt incorporated into the baseline budget for the building? It's incorporated into the baseline budget of the district and then reallocated out based on per pupil. For the building. No, it, it sounds like it's- Enrollment. Spread it's spread evenly across every student. Yeah. It is okay. Because it's district, it's at the district level. Okay. So then, okay, thank you. Can I make an observation? This is also on slide 22. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is assuming we're keep we're rolling up everything we have. And if you look at the numbers on slide eight for East Mount Player, currently there's 206, and you're projecting 169 which is almost 40 students less keeping the same personnel. Yep. And I think that's why if you looked at the, the range of numbers this year, you wouldn't see such a, a wide range because this is saying that East Montpelier, I'm curious where that number comes from, has almost 40 less students next year, but would be having the same number of personnel. Yeah, so the NESDEC numbers for East Montpelier for next year are what we've been using, and they don't, don't seem, they're, they're not our best number. We're, try, we're trying to figure like, we're, where those 40 kids are going. Yeah, so we'll, we'll work on making sure we, we clean that up, but that is a good observation. Yeah. <laughs> I, on page 22, when we're talking about per, per Per pupil, we're talking about actual pupils in this case, or are we talking about our weeded pupils? Actual kids. Can we make a note of that? Yep. Since we talk about both in the presentation. Actual physical kids. Yes. 
All right, um, I'm going to show one more thing and then um, I've got to move on for us. Um, we will incorporate a lot of this information and, and, and clean this up for you. I just appreciate the opportunity to kind of give you a draft and hear these questions. But I also have had the question around uh, building configurations and capacity. Um, I just want to make sure that people were aware. I threw this slide on over here to the, the left where each school is listed. You can click on it and see a blue, uh, layout of the classrooms. So it gives you um, the layout of each school, the number of classrooms. So that, that was a request that's come several different ways. But just so you know, the project, the current enrollment, the projected enrollments, um, and we did that by um, the, for the reconfiguration purposes, the number of classrooms that exist in each one of those buildings, and then the projected classroom need um, based upon our reconfiguration numbers that we've been showing um, for um, each of the schools. And so that tell that shows you that uh, that does not count. Well, I say the projected classroom needs; those are the classrooms needed for K five. I, I know this has been a topic of a, of a lot of commentary. I I think a footnote just you know so that you know on the document saying this is you know for K five, and then also this is this is just like your core you know core classrooms, not including like your, your music. Art music, yeah. correct. I think that also you know, a footnote to, to that effect as well. So if that just carries along with the graphic, mm -hmm. it would be really helpful. No problem. Yeah. Steven, another thing I was looking at that column of projected need, it looks like all of our buildings have quite a few classrooms available, but I think it might be helpful to even have something about pre-K because most of our buildings have two rooms, mm -hmm. at least one room designated. So that number discrepancy isn't accurate on this slide when it is this projected classroom need that does not include pre-k right correct another foot yes <laughs> or a cleaned up slide <laughs> or it needs but i just want to at least get some of this information out there for us so that yeah. so that we we can get that and we'll clean that up some more okay so that i appreciate so much the opportunity to show you that information and for us to uh, be able to uh, get some feedback on that. And then I'm going to turn this over to my you, colleague. You get to present that. <laughs> Do I? Yes. Stephen, okay. before we go too far, can I ask for some clarity or yeah. something? Chris specifically asked for a four elementary school model. And that has been something this committee has said, no, we're gonna say no to that right now. And so gone back and forth, I'm wondering what the will of the committee and then eventually what the will of the board is on that. Because, you know, one person saying do it is not how we roll. <laughs> so. Fair point. Yeah, I don't know if that's worth waiting until we've gone through this. It can, but I just want to put it out there that I'm not going to act on that because one person in the committee said to do it so that you know. Mm -hmm. How does everybody feel like? We can look at the criteria, which is partially filled out, the criteria table that Steve is going to present to us. I guess I would suggest that we just revisit it before the end of the meeting for now. Yes. I wanted to maybe visit criteria table and then we can talk about it, Zach. You know. I'm just going to ask. I mean, what is the you know what is the cost of producing that estimate? I mean, not necessarily in money, but in time. I don't know off the top of my head. Are you going to have it by Wednesday? No, I won't have it by Wednesday. I can guarantee you that I won't but, have but, it Wednesday. Maybe, yeah, I, but I think it's worth you know thinking about cost benefit on you know on that situation. And I think that's a question we should examine when we talk about it, for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now you can take away. Do you want me to frame this document? I would That's love helpful. for you to. Uh, at the, la the last time we met, um, one of the requests was that we create a matrix that cross-referenced all of the different possible configurations uh, with the criteria that you'd created you know, in September, August, September. And so you, what I did was create a blank table that had configurations down the left. And I think we're gonna put that in the chat for folks to see, right? Did you put a link to, in the chat? Yes. Okay. Um, can you re-link, yeah, can you resend so that everybody can get it? 
So down the left side is a ton of different configurations that were listed out by this committee um, two weeks ago. And across the top, I did my best to make two different groupings of the configuration that you also identified as important. And so the first three pages are all related to configuration about well-being and opportunities. And the second three pages are all criteria related to fiscal responsibility, sustainability, and impacts on communities and towns. And then with the data that we had access to, we tried to use color to determine if it meets that criteria, if it partially meets or does not meet, or if there's not enough data. Thanks, Jeannie. This is this was super helpful for me as well. You can see even in that first uh, three pages that uh, transportation, we need to fill that in and just get that data in there as to whether or not it meets it. So we have, um, we're still working with the bus company on that. Um, and then you can, I would just say, what do you observe? Is there any other information that we need? Those kinds of questions associated with this as you look at this. I guess the first question, does the models that we put over to the left-hand side, are there any questions about any of those? Like, so we tried to capture everything that has been brought up to date. I hope they make sense the way we put them. I think that makes sense. I think what, um, what will, I think what we need by Wednesday is definitions or criteria of these. So how you got to green versus red, because I think without that, this is this is a really helpful table. I think without that, it could be a very frustrating table for community members. So for example, I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah. So class size meets EQS standards means that, that, that none of the class sizes go above that. Right. And so writing, spelling that out, whereas the healthy classroom configurations provide intentionality, consistency, and equitable outcomes is really about the conversations we were having about um, going multi-age uh, reactively rather than proactively. Yeah. And so um, I... I can, are there other, those two I can so, see? What are the other ones yeah, you'd like I think us the, to? I think the first one is self-explanatory. I think that's fine. I'm I'm focused on the second one, I think, because yes. we're gonna, I think we're gonna get a lot of questions on that. Uh -huh. um, and maybe the equitable opportunities for students as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the other I think are, self-explanatory right the yellow in um some of these is that for example not every school currently has access to before and after school mm -hmm. some do some don't similar like the and i can spell out equitable opportunities this is really about um foreign language availability and some other things that some schools have access to and others don't mm -hmm. um not all every school has a full-time nurse and full-time counselor so yeah thank you thank that's you helpful so much. i appreciate it if you see other categories that I could make more. Um... Well, I, I was going to say the second half, I feel like are feel like more subjective. Yeah. And and each is really a separate debate. <laughs> when you say second half, do you mean the I mean, fiscally? Fiscally sustainable yeah. or financially sustainable, fiscally responsible. Yes. Resilient and responsive to future demographic changes. That's just up to enter in the group. Some of them, I mean, I think they're all subjective. I think some are a shorter conversation and some are a longer conversation um, because they have different, you know, fewer dimensions maybe, but that's... Danny, do you have a suggestion uh, <laughs> for what to, do we take that second half off? Like, what is it? What do you, what would you suggest for Wednesday? I, again, I think understanding sort of the, the basis, any criteria that were used, if possible, um, at least, you know, clarifies, um, yeah. a little bit how, how you landed where you landed, um, or how we landed where we landed, but okay. I think it's just more spotlighting that it's going to be, it's going to be, it's not going to decide the issue. I don't think looking at this and saying, oh, 
it satisfies us. Um, so I think maybe Daniel, to your point, um, one of the things that uh, you look at financially sustainable, like one elementary school, you know, is one of the options that we had put out there in the 612U32. The reason that that one's not necessarily financially sustainable is the capital project that would need to happen to have one versus the five school model may be that it's just per pupil costs are are um, are high, mm -hmm. right? So those that may be, so maybe some way of delineating out yeah. some of those, the major reasons that, that we may have put that as yeah. I think is what I hear you saying. Same with the early learning center, the capital cost to create that. Yeah, I'd also advocate using the not enough information if, if that's the, the case a little bit more, right? So gotcha. like, sustain, I my question in the previous section was about sustainability and you said you didn't model it yet. And I gotcha. appreciate that, but um, gotcha. um, but we still have a red box in the sustainable cell here. So gotcha. just have a think about that. Yeah, um, Chris has his hand up. Right. Right, and so kind of following up on these questions about uh, financial and sustainability and fiscally responsible, um, financially sustainable for how long? What projection into the future are we talking about? It could be financially sustainable for a year, uh, but then, and, and I'm assuming that this is no program cuts from what we currently have, and that we're using that as the baseline for financial sustainability. Is that right? Is that fair or not fair? So as part of so I, I think there are two discussions here. Um, so for financial sustainability, we can talk about it in terms of no program cuts, which is what we've been talking about in the configuration conversations. But I think as we talk about the budget conversation, we have to actually talk about programs at that point in time. And I know that's a real like fine slice uh, for this, but um, you know, we may say that if we keep all of our programs the same you know, whatever configuration that we have or, or offer the same programs, um, that helps us compare the the various configurations. But um, the long-term sustainability of our district, may, may we may need to have a conversation about what programs that we hold um, and keep in the future. I, I, you know, some of those are hard to determine, you know, at, uh, on the well, spot. But, but there's a value judgment incorporated here saying that this mm -hmm. configuration is not financially sustainable. Um, yep. But why, why not, and and for how long? Uh, yep. Or the ones are, and if they are, why? And you know what is the baseline that we're talking about, and for how long? Right. Um, so having that information as opposed to just, you know, and and I know it's, I know it's complicated. Uh, it's a very difficult, complicated process that we're engaged in. Um, yep. But to just, you know, check the kind of check this box with red, which is a signal. Um, is um, you know, it would be more helpful to have the whys answered, the hows and the whys. Thank you. Okay. I think Thank maybe because Chris, you were talking about financial sustainability when we were looking at the budget differences as well, and yeah. maybe maybe one way to approach that because I I think it's hard to say in five years this will still be sustainable because look how much the the operating costs have gone up just in the last two years. And, you know, if that happens year over year over year, nothing's going to be sustainable. Um, but I think what could help is when we're looking at the two, the baseline versus configuration, like, are there any, are there any differences in there that we expect to go away after one year or any that we expect to increase after one year? Or is that about like the proportion of what it costs to run our, our configuration now versus what it costs to run the, the three elementary school. Right. And I, I think that that's some of the anxiety that's coming up in the community of, you know, is this a one time savings and then it blows up again, um, particularly because of that Vermont Digger article. It said that all the money was just spent again, which I think, anyway, I won't go into that. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let's not go into that. Yeah, I know. I'm <laughs> sure I have the same feelings on it as you yeah. do. Um, Chris, would that help with the sustainability question to some extent? Um, I think it does because um, what we're working with as well is uh, what the experience or perceived experience has been with Act 46. Where were these uh, promises of it will be uh, cost savings over time? Turns out not to be. 
uh, and we hear that um, discussion uh, that surfaces here of saying, yes, you can talk about cost savings, but at what expense, to what towns, and how long do we anticipate that that will be a cost savings or program savings over time, as opposed to one year? And so having that um, projection um, into the future, I think, would be very helpful for evaluating these um, uh, configurations. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to jump in and say something because we've heard this no savings from Act 46 come up several times. Yep. I'm going to point out that this board has not examined what the projection would have been had we not merged as a district. So we don't have those numbers. Nobody has been looking at those numbers as a board, not as our board. So okay. And it doesn't mean it you doesn't can wait, up. please. Yeah. Zach. I, I would also note. I'd also argue that what we're doing right now is one of the big savings of Act that was enabled by Act 46. Mm -hmm. It just took us a little while to get to it. Yep. Chris, did you have another comment? Yeah, well, Zach, Act 46 was not, are you suggesting that Act 46 was a uh, stealth operation to have schools consolidate even further? Because if that's what you're talking about, I, I think that would be difficult argument to make, and I think we do need to address communities who are raising these questions and to say that we don't know what the budgets would have been for individual schools, um, so we can't talk about it or have it as a discussion, uh, you know, that, 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 I don't think that's a winning argument because, you know, individual schools usually did well with their budgets, and they would say, well, we would have happily continued on with our own budget, but we don't have that, so we don't have the uh, and, and there's just a different spread of of the costs across the district now that, you know, were individually held previously. So I think we do need to um, just have this discussion in the context of our community and, and the issues that our community raises, because they're the ones who are voting, too. This isn't a board vote. It's a board vote to send it potentially to the uh, to, to a vote. But the communities involved uh, are the ones who are voting. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to just say that we have enough to? Yeah, I have plenty uh, to, to do in the next uh, day and a half. Um, so uh, I, I appreciate uh, what you've, you've shared with us. And we'll, we'll continue to work on this um, to bring you as much information as possible. I know this is a tough decision. And so that's our goal, is for you to have as much information as possible to be able to do this work. So now, oh. Daniel, um, I've, I've been puzzling over like the time to ask for this, and I guess it's, I guess it's now. I'm interested in understanding like if extending, um, extending the open hours of our schools. So we talk about before and after care, and I think that's variable across the district and across the elementary schools. I'm interested in understanding if we were thinking in terms of, say, 7.30 to 5 o'clock or something really robust, I'm interested in understanding the cost of that um, in a reconfiguration model. Okay. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm, if it's, I, I would welcome pushback if it's a hard number to identify, but uh, I would, uh, I would, I'd be interested in learning more about that. Uh, so give us an opportunity to look, because there are some historical numbers that we have around some staffing and pieces like that. I know we've run after school programs um, throughout time, so we could look and just see is there a way to use some of that information to help us get an estimate. I'm not going to make any promises, yeah. uh, but, uh, but it's a good question to ask because uh, it kind of fulfills that question of are we able to expand opportunities as a result of configuration. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you mentioned that at the last meeting too and you were talking about not increasing the right being creative with schedules and not increasing the hours that the staff are working but maybe having them and were you also thinking about I, this came up I think with a sports conversation you had asked the question mm -hmm. um, are you thinking about all upper, are you thinking about it as educational or as all of the above. All of the above, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I come at it from a level two volunteer, like coach in the district, and 
while I wouldn't want to be responsible for a vast number of kids in an open building for an extended period of time, I guess I'm interested in understanding, is it a team of volunteers that could conceivably do this? Or is it ES, ESP? Does there need to be instruction? Or would there be a recommendation from administration that there be instruction? And maybe it's, so maybe to your question, which is really helpful and I appreciate it, maybe it's a range of expenses, like from one, one scenario to another, both, both of which would be improvements on the status quo. Mm -hmm. right. All right, so we have two things we need to finish off with, and it is 6.15. <coughs> so we're gonna come back to that for elementary school model. And I know we got feedback on the criteria table, but I guess from this committee, what is the thought? Understanding we're not going to have it Wednesday. Of moving forward with four elementary schools. As we, we were looking, Chris, you were asking for budget, like detailed budgetary information like we did tonight with the baseline and the three elementary school model? Um, something comparable to that, just so that we have apples to apples. And I understand the difficulty of, we're looking at, at potentially two, two different schools. Uh, Doty and and Callis um, that are that potentially may be uh, um, voting to decide whether to keep their schools open, um, and they're they're different in terms of um, class sizes. But just so that there's a uh, a comparison for what a four elementary school uh, district would look like versus a three, um, because because given what we are hearing from community input, uh, that's what we may be looking at. Uh, to be to be blunt and to not prepare ourselves with what that looks like in terms of our overall budget discussion, I think we, we do ourselves a lot of good to have that information as well. Thank you. So I think I'm going to ask people to take a peek at the criteria table. And I know that you guys have identified some holes in it. We don't have all of the judgments listed out, written out on how they came to the different um, labels met, virtually meets, does not meet, and compare the four pre-K through five or the pre-K through six options with our three elementary school options. And I'd like to hear from other board members or committee members. I'm sorry, what's the next I, mean, I would say... Uh, are we bringing forward, are we asking the administrative team yeah. to expend the time and energy and labor into bringing us a budget, much like they did for this? I understand that question, mm -hmm. but what did you ask us about the matrix? Maybe use this to help form your thoughts on that, because this is theoretically based on data mm -hmm. and our criteria that we've asked to look at for each of the alternatives. So that's what I'm guiding us to do to use the criteria that we're looking at. Keely, you had something? I, um, I would be very hesitant to come forward with this table saying that there's no cost savings to four elementary school model without having at least a cursory budget to back that up. Okay. is what I will say. Mm -hmm. I agree with Chris that we very well may well end up in that situation and I think it makes sense for us to figure out what that looks like. Daniel? Um, I would say that for me understanding like the focus on editing this matrix should be squarely on the four elementary school model. Like that should be where we spend our time when we edit this matrix and giving like clearer detail around why we're landing where we're landing in that row. I think I agree with Keeley that uh, the, the red mark in cost savings for that model raises an eyebrow for me and I'm skeptical of it. I'm also okay with leaving it out, but if, if the administration feels strongly that 
there is there is no cost savings, then yes, I do think seeing a budget's important. But I'm also okay with, you know, understanding just a little bit more about the dynamics that play there. Um, a reasonable per person might assume that half, we would, we would realize half savings. Um, and if that's not true, I'd be interested to know why, I guess. Patrick, back. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I gave your hand up. No, you guys can go in order. I'm like, to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, I just agree that, that this this is this is a likely scenario we might find ourselves in. So I just agree that it's, it would be prudent to know what the numbers are so that we can have a, a more informed, uh, make a more informed decision on October 1st. It, it might be worth sort of being able to speak more, because I, I guess I'm not sort of, Totally clear to have the difference between the fiscally responsible box and the cost savings box. You know, I think there, I do think there are a lot of voters that I talk to who sort of would would not be thrilled looking at the at the four school model and saying, "Wait a second, when you look at the quality measures, you're saying that the three school model you know, hit, you know, hits more of the boxes, and yet we're leaving all this cost savings on the table." You know, to for something that you're telling us is hitting fewer quality boxes, and so that that might go more into fiscally responsible than into cost savings. I'm not I'm not sure if that's part of where people are are, are sort of reacting to that red box and the cost savings, but that 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 might be a thing to speak to that would help with that. Chris, do you have any input on this, other than you wanted it? I think I've said all I need to say. Thank you, Ursula. Um, I was going to say, put on my board member hat for a moment and committee member hat for a minute. I have a lot of concerns with our administration expending the time and energy, and therefore we're going to talk money, to produce a model that may not meet our quality criteria, and therefore we would not, as a board, put it forward. I understand that we may end up there, because of votes but if we are talking about what we're going to put forward based on what we think is best for the students do we think now is the time for administration to bring us that budget or is it after our november is it fifth right the community's vote and in reaction to that Anybody? So yeah. I'd like to see the numbers before I make it a, to, to be able to make that judgment. I can't make that judgment that you, that you just articulated without seeing the numbers. I wonder if for Wednesday, because we, I was looking at the work that we had done to get to the two and the three scenarios, and I will say it will take a. a, a good chunk of time <laughs> to look at that with four. And I wonder if the interim for Wednesday, it just becomes the blue boxes because we don't have the data. Like I couldn't tell you, we did not go down that road far enough. I think that it, it would be safer to just have blue because we don't know the exact. So maybe Wednesday we can have a conversation about the criteria table too as a whole board. Mm -hmm. I think that's valuable time well, spent. Yes. Can I, does that, do you mind if I? I was just going to say, um, one of the other things that the board is going to have on Wednesday is also what are some of your um, considerations that you have for what kind of budget you want to see? What are the things that you need in the budget for us to, uh, for you as a board to approve it? What are the things that um, if they were or were not there, you would not approve it? And I think those two conversations may go hand in hand because, and I would just say this, if the board says that we, and I'm going to use the most outlandish number possible, if we don't want any increase in our budget from this year to next year, we want it to 0%, that would very much frame what, what we needed to do next in terms of bringing you information about configuration. Because that, you know, I think we, we might agree that the, uh, but the four 
uh, elementary school model probably fits somewhere between baseline and the three. And if you're saying as a board that, you, that it must be a zero percent or you know zero percent increase, then the three is is already not low enough. And so I think that those two conversations are going to go hand in hand, and that'll give us some more information. There is absolutely no way we can bring you the four model yeah. by Wednesday. So, um, so at least that conversation around the budget and what we what you would do to approve it or not approve it will help us probably frame that conversation more. Thanks, Zach. So, is there an assumption yeah. that? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, just think about how to save the administration time. I, mean, I realize that it's not perfect, but you know, we ha we have this bond building, you know, you know, you know cost estimate, and we've got sort of for the before and after. Given that we're sending students, we're talking about sending students in blocks. Can we just use that to get close enough? Let us look at it because there's some personnel issues there that I'm not sure that are, okay. they're not apples to apples. So I think we That's we'd why be, I asked yeah. rather than just started quoting numbers from it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that that would be the easiest way to do it, but I appreciate the thought. Chris? Since the schools, Dodie and Callis are roughly the same in terms of number of students, um, could we go with the working assumption that the savings would be half? Um, I don't know that I would make that assumption. Um, I, I'd have to look at the numbers and talk with Suzanne before we could make that assumption. Looks like the per pupil costs are significantly different, despite the number of pupils being similar between those two. Um, but just any rough calculation like that that would uh, at least inform a conversation. Understood. Okay. So then our next and final, well, final part for us is going to be what do we want to bring forward to the board from this committee on Wednesday? I hear loud and clear we're obviously bringing criteria table for conversation's sake and maybe a cleaned up copy of it. Yeah. Revised versions of both. Yes. Yeah. But what are the other key takeaways from tonight's meeting that we want to share with the full board? Chris, is that an old hand or a new hand? An old hand, sorry. <laughs> like its owner. You, do you mean like key takeaways from this discussion or do you mean like what data to bring forward? We're bringing, We're all, bringing forward, right? all of this forward, right? Yeah. Like this presentation is coming to the full board. We looked at it ahead of time so that we can give feedback so that it is a refined version mm -hmm. coming to the board. But we had this meeting, we can talk, like we went through this, but are there other key conversations that you want to bring forward from this committee to the board that you think they need to hear? Like updates from the committee, in essence. So, no. Okay, Chris. <laughs> okay, do, can we get some solid information about um, what were programmatically what would be sustained um, and what would um, be implemented uh, with the uh, three or four person model because I, I don't think that's still very clear uh, and we're looking at, at I think based on the calculation um, between the current model and at and, and three configuration model three elementary school configuration model um, a Cost differential of you know two point four million roughly two point four million dollars, and figure out why that is and what that you know how that is reflected in operations um, of of even the three configuration school um, because that's a significant reduction, and I think we, it would show up somewhere. So being able to talk about that and what it would, you know, in a very solid way look like. Do you want that to come from the committee or are you asking for administration to include that in their presentation? I think administration because they're the ones who, who know. Or Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good 
anybody else? Yep, so we're gonna move into public comment. We have no members of the public here, so if you wanna raise your hand on screen and I will call on you. Lila? I just wanted to uh, respond to the information that was given about how a combined Romney and Doty school would work. Um, it adds absolutely nothing to what's been uh, presented before. When you say they're going to be seven K through five classrooms, we knew that all along. A lot of the questioning is about what's going to happen with the pre-K um, in April the modeling said there would be two classes out of 20 students. We don't know how that would work. We don't know how it would be um, connected or not connected to um, community connections. And depending on how many classrooms are needed for pre-K, we might not have <laughs> enough classrooms for the specials like music and art. So I, I don't know how to be more clear about it, but I think it's the information about pre-K has been incomplete for reasons I don't understand and that the community doesn't understand. So. Thank you. Oh. Did you have more? I'm sorry, I feel like I cut you off. No, I, I guess, okay. you know, I, I'm gonna, I'll send the board a memo, you know, explaining this, but it would save a lot of time if somebody would answer the question. Thank you. Caitlin Hawowski. Thank you. That's a good one. Yep. Um, so uh, to my understanding, and again, I only got to review the slides that you've all seen very briefly uh, as well. Um, to my understanding, Doty has shown itself to be the most financially effective uh, and it also carries no debt load. And I can't help but notice that our current debt levels are nearly $1 million. And so it, to an extent, feels a little bit like other schools need our students' dollars to make their debt loads feasible. Uh, and I just wanted to point that out. And then as I was looking at the future enrollment numbers, I noticed that we were no longer breaking things out by school uh, or building. And that really mystifies shifts, declines, what have you of uh, individual town student populations. And I think that would be really helpful for our community to see um, because in here in Worcester, Doty has been relatively stable. Uh, and I just wanted to speak really briefly about proactive versus reactive multi-grade classrooms. Um, in speaking to both previous teachers here, or previous students here, current uh, parents and students, nobody feels that our uh, combined grades are reactive. They're actually a really po big positive for our student body. Uh, and if you were to speak to anyone who's currently in the building, I think you would hear a lot of positives around that experience. Thank you. Thank you. Alan? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So I sent something in chat, but I I wanted to, to, tr to try and explain why I think Somebody looking at a lot of these, a lot of the charts that were presented tonight, are they're going to have a pretty different view of what's happening here because it really looks like Worcester and Callis are the relatively low cost to educate schools. Romney and East Montpelier are the lower, are the relatively high cost to educate schools. So Worcester and Callis kids are going to be sent to a high cost school, and that's making Romney and East Montpelier per pupil cost lower but still not as low as they were at Worcester and Callis. So the question is, shouldn't you want to be sending at least some kids from Romney and East Montpelier to Worcester and Callis where the per pupil costs are lower? And why, why would you close the low cost schools? It, it, just, it just doesn't make any sense when someone looks at the story that these charts can be seen to be telling. And I, I, I understand that there, there are a lot of complications in how the money flows through the district, but it's pretty bald that the low cost schools are the ones that are being knocked off. And it's, it's um, I don't understand why. Thank you. Thank you. Can 
Can I just comment on that quickly? That That is correct for Dodi, and I appreciate that comment. Um, I think that's something that struck me as well. And it's not, it's not right for Callus, though. Callus is more expensive than Romney and a little bit less expensive than he's walked there. So it's 32,000 for Callus, 30,000 for Romney, and 35,000. And Kaylee, you're looking at page 20. Kaylee, you're looking at page 22? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. With no other questions, I'm looking to adjourn. Does anyone want to make a motion? Daniel. Could, could I oh, just. Oh, you would like to ask a question. Because it feels a little less uh, like we have to obey the conventions of our full board meeting. I think I would like. To ask for one other sort of, I would like us to annotate a little this budget by building to sort okay. of explain explicitly what we think the factors are that More uh, that are uh, a a contributing to um, those baseline budget differentials. Thank you for the comments. I I can tell you uh, specifically, student need drives a lot of it. I know you said that before. Yeah, and I guess. So students at Doty, there may not be students that have as high of a need as students at East Montpelier or Callis. And maybe one other element is what, you know, you mentioned to us as, as it was presented, what was included and what was divided among student population across mm -hmm. the district. And so maybe a little bit better definitions of like what's included in that budget uh, expenditure per student by building, or yeah, per pupil by building would be useful. And you know, in that also the ones that are the district expenses that have been divided per pupil. We will do our best. Uh, and if there is more information on pre-K, I think that that should be helpful. Yeah. I move to adjourn. <laughs> awesome. Second. Thank you. Here, Jared.